Hello and welcome back to my channel. If it's your first time here, I am Danielle and I cover true crime. So today's case is on Lorenzo Gilead, also known as the Kansas City Strangler. For some reason, African American serial killers are not as well known as their white counterparts, even if they've committed more crimes. I don't know why that is, but when I heard about this case, I felt like I needed to cover it. It's just another infuriating case. So many senseless murders and this man got away with it for a long time because his victims were not cared for by society, by law enforcement. No one bothered looking for them. No one bothered solving their cases. No one thought that a serial killer was targeting this group of women, most likely because of their profession. So most of Lorenzo's victims were sex workers. They worked in prostitution. And if you don't know, prostitutes and sex workers are not really cared for in society, are not really cared for by law enforcement. And it's it's very disheartening because it shouldn't matter what you do for a living. It shouldn't matter where you're from or what your background is. If you are a victim, you deserve justice just as much as other normal citizens, right? So let's get into Lorenzo. And I'm going to be reading his Wikipedia and going over the case and also giving my opinion towards the end. So Lorenzo... Jerome Gilead Jr. was born on the 24th of May 1950 and is known as the Kansas City Strangler and an American serial killer. A former trash company supervisor, Gilead is believed to have raped and murdered at least 13 women and girls from 1977 to 1993. He was convicted of six counts of murder on the 16th of March 2007. So, as I mentioned, he was a former trash company supervisor. He actually started off as a driver for this company and then worked his way up into management. And all of his colleagues only had positive things to say about him. They said that he was very committed to the job. He was easy to work with. He was a very pleasant man and sort of like a star employee. And it's often the case with these killers where society, people around them only have good things to say about them, but they lead these double lives they have these secret fantasies and horrible urges to harm those who are more vulnerable than they are and this was exactly the case with Lorenzo Gilead so Lorenzo Jerome Gilead Jr. was born like I said on the 24th of May 1950 in Kansas, Kansas City Missouri and he was one of five children born to Lorenzo Gilead Sr. and his wife Laura from an early age, Lorenzo Jr. exhibited excessively aggressive behavior. During his school years, he played on sports teams with his brothers. He was much larger than his peers, he f and he physically assaulted smaller children and earned a reputation as a bully. So due to his lack of discipline and poor academic performance and chronic absenteeism, he was forced to drop out of school before the 10th grade. During the mid-1960s, he met a young woman named Rena Hill, with whom he soon began a relationship. On the, 20th, on the 20th of November, 1968, Gilead and Rena married after they had found out that she was pregnant. Despite this, Lorenzo began to indulge in crime and to exhibit deviant sexual behavior towards women. In January 1969, Lorenzo was arrested on charges of assaulting and raping a girl he knew, but was later released when a reconciliation agreement was reached between the two parties, with the victim retracting the charges after Lorenzo apologized to her. In 1970, his father, Lorenzo Gilead Sr., was convicted of rape. 
Two years later, Lorenzo himself would be arrested again for raping and assaulting another woman, with the victim claiming that he had, that he had choked her into unconsciousness. She identified Lorenzo in a lineup, but they deemed the testimony as questionable and then the charges were dropped, which was a big, big, big mistake. A big mistake. Remember he had been arrested for the same crime just two years prior and somehow the police believe that another victim's testimony is questionable. Like, I, I don't get it. In 1973, he was arrested for assaulting his wife with Rina Hill telling police that he had been physically and sexually abusive for all the years they had been married. Ultimately, he was forced to pay a fine and to divorce his wife. So, he had also been abusing his wife at home. This is how despicable this man was. He was so sexually aggressive, not only to his wife, but to other women out in public. And the police did nothing. Oh, it's terrible. He never faced any criminal charges or went to jail for these crimes. He just had to pay a fine and divorce his wife. Like, how does this happen? How does this happen? In February 1974, Gillard was arrested for raping a 25-year-old exotic dancer who identified him as her attacker from a photograph. But yet again... The charges were dropped when the two parties reached a reconciliation agreement. What is a reconciliation agreement? And why? Okay, of course, you can't force anybody to press charges against someone. But why do the police not or the courts do something about somebody who has a history of committing these very serious offenses against women? Why don't the police step up? I mean, you can't, again, like I said, you can't force any victim to you know, press charges or to keep their testimony because as victims, you often feel like, I don't want to go through the ordeal of a trial. I don't want, you know, to be shamed publicly. I don't want, you know, to be blamed for anything. So like, oh, you were asking for it or for it to be, you know, to come into question. I understand all of that. But why doesn't law enforcement and the court system do something about the actual perpetrator? I, I don't understand why they couldn't do something. Like place him on probation, place him, you know, get him to, you know, just not be part of society that much. If you can't throw him in jail, do something. I mean, you have an ankle monitor on him, I don't know. Maybe that doesn't make any sense. But he keeps being set free time and time again. And he does nothing different. He just goes on, finds a new victim. That's the part I'm frustrated with. So only five months later, can you imagine? Five months later, he would be arrested again for raping a minor, a 13-year-old daughter of a friend on the banks of the Missouri River. As the victim changed her testimony, the charges were dropped, but Lorenzo was convicted of sexual acts with a minor and received a nine-month sentence in the Jackson County Jail. After his release... He was married a second time, but his wife soon left him and filed for divorce, claiming that, like his ex-wife, Rena Hill, she was beaten and sexually abused by her husband. In the late 1970s, Gilead married a third time. So this is obviously a man who has no trouble finding wives. He must be charming enough and innocent enough that people actually believe him. Believe that he's this decent guy who would not harm a soul, until he shows them their true colors. This is, it's insane. In 1979, Lorenzo Gilead was arrested on charges of assaulting a young couple, raping the girl and threatening to kill her fiancé. Despite the fact that the victims identified him as the attacker, he was acquitted by a jury verdict at his September 1980 trial due to lack of evidence. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah, a father, two victims identify him as a perpetrator. We know his history, but yet a jury acquitted him of the charges. At the trial, I'm not sure if they were aware of his prior crimes, but somehow they acquitted him. 
because there was not enough evidence. It's so disheartening. A few months later, because he's unable to stay out of trouble, he was arrested for aggravated assault on his third wife, but got away with an administrative fine and a divorce. So again, he always gets away with a slap on the wrist. He's a free man, you're free to do whatever you want. In February 1981, he attacked his ex-wife on two separate occasions. In the first one, he knocked out her front teeth and in the second, he stabbed her in the hand with an ice pick. He was arrested and charged with third degree assault but was let go on a suspended sentence and probation. In November 1981, Gilead was again arrested for theft but was released on $3,500 bail. That same spring, he received a four-year prison sentence for violating his probation. During his incarceration, his sister, Patricia D. Dixon, a prostitute, was convicted of murdering a client in 1983 and sentenced to 11 years imprisonment, in addition to being implicated in the murder of another prostitute. So, Lorenzo and his family, this is a crime family. They've all committed crimes. His sister committed a murder. And was implicated in the murder of another prostitute and she faced trial time. Lorenzo goes on to sexually assault and attack multiple women. Multiple women, three of them being his wives. Doesn't see a day in jail for those crimes specifically. How does this make sense? How does that make sense? On the 10th of January 1983, he was paroled. But was soon returned to prison after he was arrested in Wyandotte County, Kansas for making bomb threats. He was released again in late 1985 and in January 1986 he got a job as a garbage man at the Diffenbow Disposal Service where his father worked in the maintenance department. On, the, on December 23, 1987, Lorenzo was arrested and interrogated as a potential suspect in the murder of... 36-year-old Sheila Ingold, during which his blood sample was taken but was released due to lack of evidence. In 1991, he married for a fourth time and was promoted to company supervisor, granting him control of several garbage disposal teams in various parts of Kansas City. In July 1996, Lorenzo's neighbor went to the police claiming that she had been sexually harassed by him since September 1995. No charges were brought against him and the woman moved away soon after. So she ended up moving away because she'd been harassed by this man for such a long period of time. Police never brought any charges against him. So she ended up moving. Because when law enforcement won't help you, you have to help yourself. It's ridiculous. Aside from this incident, Lorenzo isn't known to have committed any crimes after 1993 with his friends and acquaintances speaking of him in a positive manner. In 2001, Kansas City Police Department received a multi-million dollar federal grant aimed at re-examining cold cases using new DNA technology. So after examining the blood sample taken from Lorenzo Gilead, the investigation team conclusively connected him to the murders of six women in the area including Sheila Ingold, for whose murder he was considered a suspect back, back in 1987. So in addition to this, he was also linked through circumstantial evidence to the killings of at least six more women, killed between April 1977 and January 1993. All of them were between the ages of 15 and 36 and were strangled with various items, including nylon stockings, laces and wire. The bodies were found dumped in various areas around Kansas City, from landfills, snowdrifts, abandoned buildings, vans, fields, and parking lots. So, very young women from the ages of 15 to 36, most of them working in sex work, and no one was in a rush to solve their cases. No one at all was... No one... Did anyone even think that there's a possibility that there's a serial killer on the loose? targeting women because most of the victims were found killed in a very similar manner. In fact, the exact same manner. 
just different materials were used to strangle them with. How does this happen? Like, why do we not care about sex workers? Why do we not care? Is it because we don't approve of what work they do? That they have to fend for themselves in the society? That should something happen to them, well, who cares? Why don't they do honorable work? It's such a ridiculous thing to think about. But when you think of... The media also didn't report on these women's cases. They didn't get national coverage or even international coverage. Most of these cases, oh, body found in a landfill. You know, very short descriptions, like no more than a paragraph. And I did my research. There wasn't much coverage on the victims. Again, possibly motivated by the line of work. And we've seen it with so many other serial killers who target vulnerable people, who target women who are in sex work. It's, it's, it's just so sad. that There's never justice for them until it's way too late. Until years go by, decades go by, and by the time there is justice, no one cares. Until, like, no one cares at that point. The case is being solved, like, 30 years later. Who ca- People are like, oh, like, they caught the guy who was committing these murders that many years ago. It's just, it's horrible. All of the women, except for one, were known prostitutes. Nine were found either fully or partially naked and 11 were sexually assaulted. The murders were considered unrelated until 1994. How can they be unrelated when there's a striking resemblance in each case? The MO is so obvious and yet deemed unrelated. It's happening in the exact same city. It's not happening all over the country or all over the world. It's happening in the same city. They have the same work. Okay, I'm just going to calm down and continue telling the story. As a result of these findings, Lorenzo Gilead was arrested on the 16th of April 2004 and charged with 12 counts of first degree murder. He has always denied committing these murders, always denied it, has never confessed to a single one, refuses to to this day. He claims he's innocent and that there's no reason for him to have committed these murders. He says that these women couldn't have done anything to make him angry enough to kill them as if a killer needs a reason to kill. Or as if a serial killer, like your motive is, oh, they made me angry. That has never been the motive for a serial killer, ever. Okay? Ever. It's not a crime of passion or whatever. This man sought out vulnerable women, strangled them, sexually assaulted them, dumped them. Simple as that. That's that's it. So, after his arrest, he was charged with the following murders. And I'm just going to go through his victims, their names and their stories. Stacy L. Swafford was 17. She was last seen alive on the 10th of April, 1977. Her body was found a week later at a vacant lot bearing signs of suffocation. The subsequent investigation determined that she had recently arrived in Kansas City as she was homeless and trying to make a living off prostitution. Gwendolyn Kaizen, 15, found strangled on the 23rd of January, 1980, a day after her father had reported her missing. When found, her neck and wrists were tightly wrapped with wire. It was later established that the girl was a prostitute and was last seen by her parents the week prior. Margaret J. Miller, 17, found strangled on the 9th of May, 1982. Like the previous victims, Miller earned an income through prostitution. So, these are young women. The first three victims, young women. Young women. Left to fend for themselves. One of them went missing. Her father reports her missing. And like the next day, she's found killed. Where's the urgency to solve a case? Where's the urgency to solve the cases of the other two teenagers? There was no urgency. The next victim, Catherine M. Berry, was a 34-year-old woman. She was found in an abandoned building on the 14th of March, 1986, with a stocking wrap tightly around her neck. She was mentally ill and was the only known victim not to be a prostitute. 
but often spend time associating with the marginalized people in society as they run away who slept in homeless shelters. So she may not have been a prostitute, but she herself was a vulnerable person. She slept in homeless shelters. She, you know, she resonated with people who were not doing that well in life. And unfortunately, she became a victim as well. So Naomi M. Kelly, 23-year-old woman, was found strangled in a park on the 16th of August, 1986. Kelly was a student at a business school and a single mother raising two children, but the investigators uncovered that she was forced to engage in prostitution due to financial issues. A killer had used a towel to strangle her, which he had left near the body. So another young woman, just trying to, def trying to fend for herself, trying to make something of her life, found herself in prostitution. She was in business school. She's trying to feed her two babies. And her life was cut short. It's just, it's, it's so heartbreaking. Deborah Sue Belvins, a 32-year-old 32 woman, found strangled on the 27th of November, 1986. Her completely nude body was found in some bushes next to a church. Anne Barnes, 36, found strangled near the city center on the 17th of April, 1987. Barnes was an exotic dancer and a prostitute who worked at a le local establishment. Kelly A. Ford, 20 years old, found strangled on the 9th of June, 1987. Her almost completely naked body was found dumped at the edge of a cliff near one of the city's parks. It was later found that Ford was a drug addict and known prostitute working in the area. Angela Mayhew, 19 years old, found strangled on the 12th of September, 1987. Unlike the other victims, Mayhew was found fully clothed on the side of a road and despite being a prostitute, no trace of sexual assault was found during the autopsy. So that was different. Sheila Ingo, 36, she was found strangled on the 3rd of November, 1987. She was a prostitute as well. Her body was found inside an abandoned van near an auto shop in Kansas City. In this case, her killer had stolen two rings from her corpse. Carmeline Renee Hibbs, was 30 years old, was found strangled on the 19th of December, 1987. A partially nude body was found in the parking lot of an apartment building. Connie Lynn Luther was 29 years old. She was found strangled on the 11th of January, 1993. Luther, a prostitute, was found in a snowdrift with a noose made of laces tied around her neck. On June 23, 2006, following the result of DNA expertise, Lorenzo Gilead, who was charged with an additional murder of Helga Kruger was a 26-year-old woman found strangled with a towel in Kansas City in February 1989. An Austrian immigrant, Kruger was, con was a convicted extortionist, but police found no links pointing towards her being in the prostitution business. Lorenzo Gilead was also considered a possible suspect in the 1987 murder of 21-year-old store clerk Paula Davis, whose body was later found dumped in nearby Ohio. So, in, you know, what? before we move on to the trial, I just want to say that with sex workers, prostitutes, girls working on the streets, having to fend for themselves, many of their families aren't part of their lives. Many of them don't have anyone to advocate for them, you know. Many of them won't be reported missing. And... When you have no one fighting for you, it's so easy for the perpetrator to get away with these crimes. It's so easy for you to become forgotten. It's so easy for you to just be a name, you know, in a newspaper with a short little paragraph on what happened to you. And for no attention to be given to your story. And that is so heartbreaking. So... Not only are you victimized by this awful person, but then the justice system fails you so much. For years and years, for decades even. Sometimes for all time in certain cases. You know, the erasure of these victims is so heartbreaking on top of everything they've already been through. I just, I, I can't stand it. Which is why, you know, true crime is so important 
these podcasts we listen to, these channels we watch. It's so important that we tell the stories of these victims. It's so important that we advocate for them. It's so important that we show their families love and support. It's so important that we bring awareness to these stories and to these cases. In January 2007, Lorenzo's attorneys were able to negotiate an agreement with the Jackson County Attorney's Office. In exchange for dropping the death penalty, the client would agree to a trial without a jury, which began on the 5th of March of that year. Lorenzo was tried on seven first-degree murder charges. The prosecution focused mainly on DNA evidence that criminal forensic experts shows he had sex with the victims around the time they were killed. All the victims have several things in common. All were found dead during the same one-and-a-half-year period. All were left in secluded or obstructed locations. All were strangled. All showed signs that they were involved in a struggle. All were missing their shoes. And all but one showed distinct signs of sexual intercourse. Prosecution attorney Jim Knetza said in opening statements to the court, Throughout the proceedings, Lorenzo Gilead refused to admit his guilt and insisted on his innocence. How can he insist on his innocence? It's, you know, you could argue that, okay, yes, he had a thing for prostitutes. He saw many prostitutes. And there are hundreds, thousands, millions of men who have had dealings with prostitutes. But when every single prostitute you've come in contact with ends up dead and your DNA is found on their bodies shortly after their interactions with you, that is suspicious. How can you still claim your innocence? I, I don't understand that. Probably because he got away with so many other crimes where multiple victims identified him as the perpetrator. And he got off scot-free every single time. He probably thought, oh, the justice system loves me, so I'll get away with it again. Just take the death penalty off the table. I'll agree to a trial. Just take the death penalty off the table. I'm sure I can beat it again. The audacity of this man. But 12 days later, during his trial, Lorenzo Gilead was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murders of Barry, Kelly, Barnes, Ford, Ingold, and Hibbs. He was acquitted of killing Mayhew since only, only human hair and no semen was found on her body and the results of a DNA analysis of said he being inconclusive. He initially served his life sentence in Western Missouri Correctional Center before being transferred to the Crossroads Correctional Center in July 2019. In 2018, Lorenzo Gillier received a second wave of infamy after he was interviewed by British journalist and presenter Piers Morgan. During said interview, Gillier again claimed that he was innocent and said that he had never met any of his victims. So... <laughs> I watched a snippet of that interview and Piers Morgan asks him, so Lorenzo, do you think I'm stupid? Do you think I'm an idiot? You're claiming not to have met any of this woman. And then Lorenzo just gets up, takes his mics off, walks away. Like, I'm not doing this. How do you claim that you never met the victim? So as you claim you never killed them, then you claim you never met them, but your DNA was found on them. And not just... Any DNA, your semen is found on them. And remember, this man worked in a garbage disposal business. At some point, he was a driver. So it's possible that while he was on his routes, he picked up these girls, you know, had intercourse with them, and then killed them. Or he, he, he claimed to want to have intercourse with them, but then ended up raping and killing them. I think personally that's what happened. But, but he's still denying it. He's still denying it. And his name is... He doesn't have a household name. He doesn't. Everything is done. And the average person would not know him. The way they know Jeffrey Dahmer, for example. And I'm not saying that this man should be famous. But I feel like for the victims and for their families and for these stories to still be told... This man's name needs to be known. People need to know that evil like this, like this exists. And people need to know that law enforcement failed these victims, all of his victims. For years. For years. So that is all I have on 
this case. He is, what, a 72, 73-year-old man, still in jail, facing a life sentence. He's going to die in prison. But he's going to maintain his innocence for all time. Apologies for any noise in the background. I hope you found this video educational. I know we shouldn't be entertained by we shouldn't be entertained by true crime. This was for educational purposes only. I am Danielle. This was another episode of Crime in Questions. And I hope to see you in the next video. Take care of yourself, be kind, and please do not harass the victims or the victims' families in any true crime case that you come across. Take care. Till next time.